welcome Nashville Vineyard and anyone else who is listening, who is tuning in either this Sunday morning or throughout the week. Um, I hope your week has been super good and it's just gone super well. Just join us as we worship Jesus this morning and even though we're all separate and it feels different to watch a screen while you worship, I just encourage you to just really invite the Holy Spirit into your home and just be okay with the fact that we can worship God no matter where we are or no matter how it feels, we can still worship Him. So God, I just thank you for this morning. I thank you that we have the privilege to worship you this morning, that your Holy Spirit resides in us and that your presence is just in our homes. And I just thank you for how you're going to move today and throughout this week. In Jesus' name, amen. There is 
Hey, happy Sunday. Uh, thanks for gathering with us uh, today. It's, it's an honor to be able to do this, to, to be able to bring uh, the word of the Lord uh, to you. I know um, Nashville Vineyard, um, you guys are, are here with us and uh, maybe listening throughout the week. I also know that there are people all over the world um, that are, are tuning in each Sunday and listening. I'm seeing people from uh, France and uh, Australia and Africa and the Philippines and it's just amazing and so we just want to say welcome thank you so much for spending uh, some time with us we hope that the Lord um, is speaking to you as he's speaking to, to us and I know he is and I hope you're hearing him and I hope you're spending time in his word I hope you're spending time in prayer and I hope that you're taking this opportunity this moment in time to begin to move uh, further into the things that the Lord has for you because he has good things and uh, and he has a plan uh, for you so we're, we're excited to to gather even here online um, and we're looking at uh, how the Lord speaks through different times uh, with his people when things aren't going so great and uh, and maybe things aren't going super great in your life maybe things look very chaotic in your life maybe you feel like uh, you're you're in a barren place uh, you're in a time of wilderness, you're in a time of exile, or maybe you're even in a time of judgment. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the Lord speaking to his people in exile, and we looked at that in Jeremiah chapter 29. Uh, last week, we took a look at God speaking to his people in the wilderness, uh, in the story of Exodus. We talked about how uh, God delivered the people out of Egypt, but he needed to get Egypt and the culture of Egypt out of his people so they could carry the culture of heaven uh, as they begin to inherit the promises that he had for them. Uh, this week we're going to take a look at 1 Samuel uh, chapter 15, and we're looking at, um, at the story of Saul, uh, and we're, we're wanting to see how does God uh, speak to us in, in maybe a time of judgment, and, and what does that mean, and how does that happen? So before we dive in, we're going to pray, and, uh, and then we're going get, to get into uh, the scriptures. So Lord Jesus, we thank you. We, we bless your name. We worship you. We honor you, Jesus. You're king. We just, we just say you are king of this world. You're king of our lives. You're king over our circumstances. You're king over everything. Lord Jesus, you reign supreme. Would your name be lifted up? Would you uh, form us uh, more into your image? Would you begin to to completely fill us with your spirit. Holy Spirit, would you fill us afresh, fill us anew? Uh, would you just baptize us in your uh, spirit and in your fire? Would you just begin to fall and rest on us? Would you give us ears to hear and hearts to receive uh, what it is you have for us today? Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together even this way. And we bless your name, Lord. We bless your name. And it is in the name of Jesus that we say these things. Amen. So we're going to go uh, to 1 Samuel chapter 15. But let me give you some backstory about Saul. Saul was the first king of the people of Israel, God's chosen people. Now, originally, Israel, it wasn't supposed to have a king. They had some judges uh, that, that sort of made some, some rules. But, but honestly, they were supposed to be ruled and, and be led, and their king was supposed to be God. But the people looked around and they said, everyone else has a king. Can we have a king? And, uh, and, and so finally the Lord relented and gave them a king. And the very first king that he gave them was a guy named Saul. And Saul had some issues. Um, he needed some inner healing, maybe a little deliverance. Had a lot of things going on. Um, didn't do a great job. And uh, eventually uh, the Lord removed uh, the kingdom from Saul and placed it on David. You'll remember David, David and Goliath. And uh, David becomes king, and uh, it's this whole thing. First and Second Samuel are, are fascinating reads. Uh, I, I just encourage you to, to just dive in maybe this week, next week, and read through First and Second Samuel. It's First of all, it's just very entertaining, honestly. But it's also just jam-packed with wisdom and revelation uh, from the Lord. And so I just I would just really encourage you to read that. It's, it's just, it's great. And uh, I think I think it'll be good for you. Uh, so we're gonna pick up uh, here. But uh, so so Saul gets to be uh, king, um, and and then he has two instances where he 
uh, falls from grace. He loses his um, his inheritance because uh, first first what, what what was spoken over him was that uh, his line would not continue to inherit uh, the kingdom, and then eventually he loses uh, his anointing as king. He loses his position and, and role. And, and so we want to take a, a look at, um, at what is happening here. Uh, the first time, and we're not going to read it, chapter in chapter 13, I, I encourage you to go there. The very first time uh, this happens, um, they, they come back uh, from, from some adventure, and, uh, and Saul is waiting on Samuel. Samuel is the prophet appointed by God. Samuel has anointed Saul, and Samuel is kind of the spiritual father. Uh, of uh, Saul and Samuel as the prophet uh, has some duties that he's supposed to perform and Saul as the king has some duties he's supposed to perform but Saul comes back Samuel's not there and he goes ahead and does Samuel's job for him because he's the king after all and so he has some presumption in that but the scriptures tell us that the, the main reason uh, that Saul uh, did this was because he began to see the people were beginning to scatter beginning to get um a little bit annoyed and impatient and then he began to see some of his enemies that were beginning to gather and so he just thought i've got to do this I, i've got to take care of this and it's not my job but uh, i'm going to do it anyway so samuel comes and and says i can't believe you did this uh and this is going to cost you uh your family's inheritance of the kingdom pick up in uh chapter 15 and he loses not only uh, his familial inheritance, he loses everything. And uh, so we're going to pick up here uh, in chapter 15. We're going to go um, start with verse 1. So it says this, Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek. For what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek, and utterly destroy all they all that they have, and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. That's a lot. Verse four. So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Talim. 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, get down from among the Amal Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amal Amalekites, and Saul attacked the Amalekites from Hevelah all the way to Shur which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. This is verse 9. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen, the fattings of the lambs and all that was good and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, they utterly destroyed. Verse 10. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. So when Samuel arose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed he set up a monument for himself. And he has gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. This is verse 14. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Verse 15. And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, Be quiet. And I will tell you what the Lord told me last night. And he said to him, Speak on. So Samuel said, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did you not did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? 
Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? That's a lot. So, a lot of questions surrounding all of that. Um, but here's what I believe the Lord is saying uh, in this time. Saul had a job. He had a commandment. He, he had something that he was supposed to do. And it seemed a bit much to Saul and to the people. It seemed a little bit extra. It, it seemed like it wasn't exactly the best thing to do. And so Saul then decided to take it upon himself and, and to begin to, to, to do justice and work out uh, things the way that he saw fit. And this is, I believe, something that the Lord is wanting to come to his church, to us, and to say and to remind us that there are ways that seem right to men, but the Lord's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And, and the way that he does justice and mercy and the way that he moves amongst uh, the people of the earth and, and the way that he commands his people are just different from the ways that we uh, would do things uh, as people. And so I believe what the Lord is saying is that we need to be careful to, to do what the Lord tells us to do and not what we think we ought to do. This is a time where we're, we're really in an unknown place. We're in an unknown position. We're, we're at an unknown point in history, and we, we none of us really know what we are to do. And, and some of us are saying that this is judgment coming upon us. Some of us are saying that this is judgment coming upon uh, the, the country or the world. And, and some of us are saying it just feels bad. We don't know what this is. Uh, but, but what we're prone to do as people is to begin to do whatever it is we think is right in our own eyes. And, and I believe the word of the Lord is saying to us today to not be so quick to jump into things just because it seems like the right thing to do. The Lord has a plan for how he wants us to move. The Lord has a plan for how he wants you to move. He has an idea. He has a thought. He has commands. He has, he has things that he's probably told you to do. He has, he has uh, people that he's told you to go talk to. He has, even right now, he has, um, there's phone calls that you've been putting off that he's been telling you to make. And, and you're saying, that doesn't really make sense. I'm going to do what I believe is the right thing to do. And, and Saul is a good picture for us here because the command of the Lord is strange here. That's a really good way to put it. It could seem you know, awful uh, uh, you know, to utterly destroy the Amalekites. Now, there's a lot in this to unpack. There's a lot we could talk about. We're, we're not going to do that today. Um, but a lot of people have written a lot of things about this particular passage. But the Lord brought this to my attention, I believe, for this specific reason. There's two chief sins that Saul commits that... That, that brings about the judgment of God upon him and it eventually removes him from his place uh, and his, uh, his calling and his anointing. The first one, back in chapter 13 that we talked about in the very beginning, I encourage you to check it out, just start at chapter 13. The first one that happens is, is that he has a fear of man and he has a greater fear of his enemies than he has of God. And so he sees, uh, he sees the people scattering, leaving him. He sees that his favor amongst people is, is dwindling, and he gets scared. And then he begins to look around because of that, and he begins to look around, and he sees the encroaching enemy. And those two things are much greater in his eyes than God. And so he circumvents what God has commanded and the order that God has put into place in order to uh, please the people and to keep the enemy at bay. And so this is the first thing I believe the Lord wants to warn us about today. We, we need to, to repent 
and to move away from having a fear of man. What do I mean by fear of man? I mean this. There, there is within all of us, honestly, this desire to, to please people, uh, to, to have people respect us, to have people uh, honor us, and to, and to, ultimately, um, to ultimately confirm that we're good and to, to gain our worth from people. And so what that means is it causes us to have a fear of man and we begin to cater towards man. We begin to, uh, to do things for, for the sake of our good name, uh, for the sake of having people like us, for the sake of, of being agreeable, for the sake of pleasing people. And this is not the chief motivation we're to have. Are we to love people? Sure. But the first command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. And so we're to love people only out of that place of love from God. And, and can I just be really, really honest with you? So much of what we do in our lives are geared towards pleasing people, are geared towards acting out of fear of what people are going to think of us. Uh, so much of our language, so much of our um, our efforts, our energies, our abilities, they go into trying to get people to affirm and esteem us. And, and, it's, and it's, it's hard, it's really hard to tell that this is taking over. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's incredibly insidious. It just seeps in, it's in the background, it's working, and we don't know. But in this story, there's a picture of, of how we can begin to tell. And here's how. When, when our enemy, when the things that are frightening and scary to us, when those things become greater than our, our fear and respect for the Lord, it's probably a good sign that we're enamored with pleasing people. Because it's the tool of the enemy to begin to cut off our inheritance. And so we, we want to make sure that we begin to, to ask the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and to say, are we guilty of the sin of pleasing man? Are, are we guilty uh, of the sin of fearing man more than we fear God? Obviously, I'm saying man. I mean man and woman. You get it. So that's the first thing here in the story of Saul. But but what we read was a different story. So so. The, how to lose our inheritance, I believe, is coming from a fear of man. We'll, we'll just lose our inheritance from that. How to lose our place and our anointing and our purpose is coming from a different place. It's coming from a place of where we believe we know better than God. Where we believe that we have a better idea uh, of how to um, do things than God does. And so we begin to take our own advice we begin to follow our own path, and we begin to do in our minds what we think is right. But God has clearly spoken a different way, a better way, a higher way. And because it goes against our own minds and what we're thinking and maybe maybe the, the group think that's happening right now, uh, because it goes against that, we're going to see that as foolishness, and we're going to do what we want to do but it's wrong. And so the Lord wants us to follow him. And, and we will feel foolish following him because he uses the foolish things to confound the wise. And I've never met anyone who genuinely thinks they aren't wise. We all think we are. And so his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He is higher than us. And he is doing things uh, on a multi-dimensional plane that we have no idea about, right? He, he is past, present, and future. He is always moving. He always uh, is and was and is, is to come. I mean, he's God, right? I mean, unbelievable, unimaginable. He's God. And God has a plan and a way for things to work. He has a plan for you, and he has a plan for the church. And his plan is just different. It's different than the world, and it's different than what you're thinking it is. 
And so I want to caution us all to, to make sure that we are actually doing what the Lord says to do. You see, he doesn't really care about your sacrifice. He doesn't care about um, what it is you're doing in order to be a good person or whatever. He cares about you being obedient. He desires and requires obedience over sacrifice. And so I feel like there are things that the Lord has, has told us to do. There's things the Lord that he has told me. And there's things the Lord has told you to do. And, and I believe that we have not done those things out of some sort of, uh, uh, we, we feel like we have a better idea. Uh, we have a better way of doing things. And if you look out at the greater landscape of things that are going on right now, everyone seems to know the right thing to do. But I'll be honest with you, there is only one right thing to do. And that is the thing that God has initiated, that God has started. That, that is the thing that God has commanded his people to do. And even though it may seem counter to the culture at the time, it may seem counter to, to even what you think is good and right, and, and justice and, and worthiness, even though it seems counter to that, the Lord has a plan and he has a people and his people are to carry out his plan and purpose. And so how does the Lord deal with us in judgment? He begins to take away. He begins to take away things from us, our inheritance, our, our purpose, our calling, but his judgments are always restorative. So if we think about how is he judging his people, uh, Israel, and, and, and in the Old Testament, when, when the Lord is judging a people, he judges the leader. When he is, uh, when, when a people are under judgment, it's, it's focused and the narrative is focused at the leader. And so if we think about how is God judging this people in, in the case of Saul, what happens is, and this is why the Lord's judgments are restorative, even in this failing, even as, um, as Saul is, is failing, uh, the Lord is simultaneously raising up um, a, a restoration in David. He's, he's judging his people, but he's simultaneously restoring that kingship. See, he could have completely wiped it out and said, I told you I didn't want a king. This is what happens. But that's not what the Lord does. When he brings his judgment about, he brings it about in a restorative way. In other words, his judgments always lead to restoration and flourishing and to newness and to a complete renovation. And so the Lord may be judging us today. He, we may be under judgment for the things that we've committed, but the promise and the hope is, is that there is restoration coming. And so the sooner that we begin to, to remember last week we talked about get Egypt out of us, the culture of Egypt out of us. And that culture of Egypt is, um, I'm not talking about people that are from Egypt right now. I'm talking about Old Testament and Exodus um, as the people of God were in slavery under Egypt. Uh, that slave culture causes us to have the fear of man, causes us to doubt the goodness and the authority of God. And that's really what Saul was doing is he was doubting God's goodness and his authority and his plans and purposes. And so the sooner we begin to rid ourselves of those things, the, the, the more uh, quickly and easily we get to begin to experience the restorative part uh, of his judgment. And so I just would like to take a moment to talk about how do we rid ourselves of this stuff. I don't know if you've ever had to uh, to try and quit something that you just couldn't quit. I don't know if you ever tried to quit smoking cigarettes. I, I don't know if you've ever tried to quit uh, drinking. But when those things happen, when you actually have an addiction to something, it, it, it's almost impossible to quit. In fact, for, for many of us, it, it is impossible. And that's why people never are able to achieve it. And so it's the same thing with these sort of sins that the Lord is bringing about inside of it. He, he's revealing those right now, all over the globe right now. Stories are coming in uh, from every direction that the Lord is moving us into repentance. 
He's moving us into a place of repentance. And so when that happens, he begins to uncover these areas in our life. Fear of man, um, a doubt, doubting of his goodness and doubting of his authority. Um, it could be a myriad of other things that he's revealing in your life. But when he reveals those things, again, when the judgment of the Lord comes, the conviction of the Lord comes, it comes in kindness and it comes in restoration. And so when he's revealing those things, the, the, the tendency is, okay, I would love to stop, but I, I can't. I can't stop doing this. And that's the key. When the Lord reveals something to you that, uh, that he wants you to repent of, the way to get free from it is to allow him to take it. Remember, his yoke and his burden are easy and they're light. And he's wanting us to make an exchange. He's wanting us to take our sins, to take all of the things uh, that, that are in us that we're needing to repent of. It could be pride, it could be arrogance, it could be lust, it could be greed, it could be who, who knows what it is. And those things, in and of your own strength, you, you just can't free yourself up. You just can't. And so many of us get caught in this cycle of feeling condemnation, feeling guilt, trying to get forgiveness, and then knowing full well we're going to turn around and do it again. Because we just have experienced defeat over and over and over again. Because we've been trying to live a good life in our own strength. And that is not the gospel. The gospel of Jesus is that you can't change. You can't save yourself. You can't rid yourself of your sins. And you can't stop sinning, not for one second. But Jesus. Jesus comes and he comes as our savior and our deliverer and our conquering king. And he offers you an exchange. He says, you give me your sin and I'll give you my burden, which is light. And so the way that this happens, the way that you make this exchange is if let's say that he's, he's brought up greed in your life and you, you feel like, man, this is something. Or maybe today, like, he's talk, like we've, we've been talking about, maybe it's a fear of man. You have feared man your whole life. You have lived your life dictated by what other people think and what other people say. And you cannot find freedom from that to save your life. You've gone and tried counseling. You've tried all kinds of things. It just hasn't worked. Here's the secret. And it's not a secret. It's all in scripture. The secret is you have to first confess. You have to say, I can't believe I have this. I'm sorry. I do. I suffer from this fear of man. And then you say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for, for putting this in front of me. Forgive me for allowing this to control me when your freedom is, is fully available. And Lord, I can't free myself of this. I can't rid myself of this sin. Would you do it for me? I need your help. Please take it from me. And I just receive your forgiveness right now in Jesus' name. And that, folks, is when freedom begins to come. When you confess and you confess that you're powerless against this sin, only through him, grace, only through his love and mercy, are we able to then conquer it. And, and because in him, in Christ, we are more than conquerors. So listen, this is a strange time. The Lord is, is bringing about judgments upon all kinds of things, but his judgments are always restorative. And it is time for us to collectively and individually repent, to say that we can't change this. We can't change anything. We need him to change it for us and to begin to release those things and allow him to come in and renovate our heart and to change everything from the inside out so that we can then begin to walk and experience freedom uh, in, in, in a way that he has for us. We're moving into the promised land, right? We, we go back to that Exodus narrative that we used last week, but we can't get to the promised land until we're free from the chains uh, that have enslaved us. This is the call for us this week. It's a call, honestly, for us every day for the rest of our lives to have a life formed in repentance. And that is what repentance 
looks like. So church, folks, we need to be repenting. Uh, you, you need to ask the Lord, what, what is it? What do I have that, that needs to go? Uh, what, what, what is going on that, that I need to change so that I can follow you uh, more, more easily and more clearly and, and more rightly? This is the time to do that. So we're, we're going to pray and, and then we're going to close. And I, I'm just going to walk you through a prayer of repentance. And, uh, and I, I, I challenge you to pray this. I challenge you to ask the Lord to, to search you. And to, and to spend some time this week and, and next week and for the rest of your life to continue to do this. So, Lord Jesus, we first of all thank you. We thank you that because of what you did for us on the cross, because of your life and your death and your resurrection and your ascension to the throne, because of that, we can actually experience a newness. We can experience uh, not just forgiveness, but we can experience transformation. And we thank you for that, Jesus. We, we, we just we thank you so much for that. So Holy Spirit, we just welcome you to, to, to say, how are we doing? What do we need to repent of? What do we need to lay down? Would you show that to us? You're so kind. You're not showing it to us to condemn us, to make us feel bad. You're, you're showing it to us because these are things that are keeping us bound. These are things that are keeping us from experiencing freedom. So Holy Spirit, right now, what do we need to repent of? You know, he's bringing things to your mind right now. Just, just say those things out loud. We confess that we do suffer from this. We confess that we suffer from the fear of man. We confess that we suffer from greed, from selfishness. We, we, we confess these things, Lord. We, we are guilty of these things. And, and we ask, Father, that you would forgive us. Would you forgive us of that? And we receive your forgiveness. But Lord, we know we are powerless to stop this. And so we ask, would you come and take it from us? Whatever those sins are, whatever those things you're suffering from, Ask the Lord to take it from us. Say, I can't do it. Would you do it? You have to do it. You, you, you must do it. It's the only way. Now, Lord, do it. Would you do it? We want to be free and follow you. And it's in Jesus' name that we ask these things. Amen. Now, hey, some of you may have said that prayer for the first time. If that's so, congratulations. You are on your way on the journey of following Jesus, and it is an incredible journey. We have online New Believers classes, and so if that's if that's you, or maybe this is the first time you've come back from the faith in years, why don't you click on that and, and sign up for that. Myself, another pastor, we'll, we'll talk with you, and we'll begin to, to talk about what it means to follow Jesus. Some of us, there are things that we need uh, specific prayer, and we need help uh, in order to do that. And so, uh, we have some online prayer uh, opportunities. We have healing prayer. We have prophetic prayer. And, and some of those might even turn into some deliverance prayer. And so if that's you, if you need any, anything like that, go ahead and click on that and sign up for that. And we'll get some prayer partners uh, to reach out and schedule a time uh, that, that we can pray. Um, this lifestyle of repentance can only happen uh, in communion with Jesus and in communion with his body. And so this is not a time to be in life alone. This is a time to, to be in uh, a place, a group of believers. Um, this in and of itself, this broadcast, it's not satisfactory. It doesn't check the box. Uh, this is fun, and, and hopefully the Lord is speaking and, and doing some cool stuff, but it happens in smaller groups of people that are following Jesus. We have some things, we're calling them home churches, uh, if, if you're in the area um, of Nashville, Middle Tennessee, uh, we're starting them all over. Um, go ahead and, and click on that, and we can get you signed up and, and signed into a group. Um, listen, we love you. Uh, the, this isn't um, a great message of, of, hey, we're in judgment, but the, the beautiful thing is that because of Jesus especially, the Lord's judgments always result in restoration. And so this is the time that, that he set aside for us clean house 
and to begin to, to make ready and make way for the day of the Lord that is rapidly approaching. Because I don't know if you know this, but Jesus is coming back again. And we believe it is soon. It's definitely sooner than it was yesterday. And so we want us to be ready. We want our hearts to be ready for what he has in store for us. We love you. We're praying for you. And we look forward to, uh, to seeing you right back here uh, next week.